Uh, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dr. Edith Mitchell, and I am clinical professor of medicine and medical oncology at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center and Sydney Kimmel Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University and Jefferson Health Systems in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. All right. Dr. Mitchell, I hear we have some good news about mortality rates. Uh, can you just share those with us? Oh, absolutely. And I am so privileged to have been a part of the development of some of the research that shows this. Both the National Cancer Institute and the American Cancer Society have produced data in 2018 showing that there has been a decline in cancer mortality or cancer death rates in this country over the last 23 years. And we have reports of a 25% decline in cancer death rates. Mm. Therefore, that amounts to more than 2.5 million people who have had cancer and did not die of it in the United States. So cancer death rates are decreasing and research um, estimates that that decline will continue. Awesome, that's great news. It's can, wonderful news. Yes, yes. Can we um, attribute that to anything? Uh, meaning specifically, what are we doing and can we do more of it? <laughs> Absolutely. So it is well recognized that uh, there are multiple components mm -hmm. that uh, impact cancer incidence rates and cancer mortality rates in this country. Um, we must look at prevention and actually cigarette smoking and the decline and cessation of cigarette smoking probably has, has been the greatest contributor to declining death rates. Uh, but also, we have new technology that allows for earlier detection and um, finding cancers at an earlier stage. We have preventive strategies that focus on the cause of cancer. So for example, the HPV vaccine and its relationship to decreasing cervical cancer uh, rates in the country. And not only is HPV involved with um, cervical cancer, but anal cancer, head and neck cancers, and others. So preventive strategy is very important. We've got better diagnostic tools, so better mammograms better CT scans for uh, evaluating lung cancer, uh, so that we have better diagnosis, those preventive strategies, but also better treatments. Mm. We have precision medicine that has allowed us, for example, in breast cancer, to identify those tumors that are more likely to respond to hormonal uh, uh, therapies, that being the estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor, as well as the HER2 receptor that allows for uh, use of drugs that specifically target the um, HER2 receptor. So precision medicine in colorectal cancer, for example, we have the microsatellite instability, which identifies those patients that might have hereditary colon uh, and rectal malignancies. Therefore, we can screen family members of those individuals who have Lynch's syndrome. Uh, we have information regarding uh, the RAS status, KRAS, NRAS, and BRAF, and that allows us to select colon cancer therapies that might be more effective in one group and that would be contraindicated in another group. So basically allowing for giving the patients, for the right patient, the right medicine at the right time. Mm. So precision medicine being very important. We have newer technology also utilizing a clinical trial called the MATCH study 
And with the MATCH study, uh, it is a clinical trial to measure uh, genomic profiling in tumors and therefore match the tumor with uh, uh, a treatment that is among a group of either singular medical treatments or some combination therapy. So precision medicine is really pushing the envelope of uh, new technologies mm -hmm. in cancer. So therefore, we have better prevention, better diagnostic studies, better treatment, and then after treatment, follow up and management of survivorship for patients. So with all of these uh, treatment strategies and treatment modalities, we can say that precision medicine is contributing to um, the advent of better therapies for patients and consequently uh, contributing factors that impact the overall death rate. Cigarette smoking as well as prevention of other uh, uh, pollutants in our air and foods have contributed. So, and better technology, better uh, colonoscopes, better endoscopy, better surgical techniques, uh, better chemotherapies, and more precise radiation. So all of these factors have contributed to uh, the decline in cancer death rates. Mm, awesome. Um, you mentioned uh, colon cancer, and we know that it's, it's rapid in the uh, black community. What are some things that, let's say, talking to a loved one, uh, that they can do as preventative measures uh, to prevent colon cancer? Sure. So we are, there are some facts about colon cancer that are really disturbing. Mm. Um, one, the incidence rates of colon cancer in young individuals younger than age 50 uh, is increasing significantly. Uh, colon cancer has a higher incident rate in uh, African Americans and about a 40% higher death rate in African Americans. Consequently, uh, the American College of Gastroenterology in 2009 recommended that African Americans uh, begin screening for colon cancer at age 45 rather than the uh, recommended age of age uh, of 50 uh, at that time. This year, 2018, the American Cancer Society has recommended that all individuals age 45 or greater and who are average risk of development of colon cancer undergo screening at age 45 and continue uh, those screening recommendations. Uh, consequently, we are searching for younger patients with colon cancer and uh, they're undergoing testing and diagnostic evaluation to determine if there is a cancer uh, earlier than age 50. So we can cross out the age 50 in recommendations and note that at age 45, individuals of average risk should begin screening. Those who have higher risk of colon cancer, those with family histories or who have the genomic profile of Lynch's syndrome should undergo screening at a much earlier age, earlier than 45. Hmm. Okay. Is there, um, just as far as cancer in general, um, is there anything that we can do in the body? You know, there's there's a lot of conversation about how uh, alkaline uh, changes the body in order to fight cancer. Is there anything that a person can do, just generally, to sure. uh, to help rid the body or at least protect the body from cancer? So, first of all, I think we have to get rid of rumors and uh, false data. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we've heard of about false data and false news and so forth. One of those is alkalinizing the body to prevent cancer. Mm -hmm. 
for individuals with normal kidney function, if you consume excess alkali, the kidneys automatically uh, normalize the body's pH. So alkalinization or consuming products that are high in alkaline content has no protective effect from cancer if the kidneys are working perfectly. Okay. And if the kidneys are not working perfectly, you should be under the care of a physician to help determine whether or not you need alkaline uh, products for your body. But then it's still not protection of cancer. It's appropriate treatment for individuals who may have uh, kidney or renal dysfunction. So the best protective and preventive methods of cancer, not only for colon cancer and breast cancer and others. Um, number one, the diet. Uh, those diets that are low in fat, high in fresh vegetable and fruit content, have a better protective effect from, uh, for protecting the body against cancer. The Mediterranean diet, in other words, uh, very important. Uh, aspirin and other COX-2 inhibitors may have some protective effect for individuals. There's a lot of research on the use of aspirin and COX-2 inhibitors, uh, and it appears that there are individuals who may have greater benefit than others from the use of aspirin. So those research studies continue. Uh, exercise. 150 minutes of uh, exercise per week, uh, five days, 30 minutes each. Uh, and that exercise can be uh, a number of factors, mm -hmm. uh, walking, swimming, others, uh, even um, very aggressive housework. So the vacuum cleaner, uh, you can include that time into your exercise uh, program for the week. So exercise, um, following uh, recommendations of uh, screening for various disease processes uh, can also contribute to uh, prevention. For example, uh, with colonoscopy, uh, the removal of a polyp in the colon will prevent that polyp from ever becoming cancerous. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, preventive strategies, the diet, the weight. Obese individuals have a higher incidence of many different cancers. So watching the weight, uh, having a good diet, uh, aspirin or COX-2 uh, consumption, but that should be under the care and recommendation of your physician. Uh, I don't recommend taking medications without a uh, physician or clinical guidance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you were talking about dispelling uh, myths and rumors. Yes. So I just want to put this one out there as well. Uh, red meat. There's been a lot of talk about red meat and its correlation to cancer. Can you speak about that? Absolutely. So there have been some studies evaluating meat consumption and the incidence of uh, colon and rectal cancer specifically, but having some relationship to other cancers as well. And uh, my recommendations are in moderation. Now, the evidence shows that those processed meats that contain especially nitrates are the biggest culprits. Okay. So fresh uh, meats that have not been um, preserved. Mm -hmm. But for other meats that have been preserved or smoked, uh, there can be some increased incidence of, uh, related to cancer. So many people ask me, well, is it just the red meat? No, it's not just the red meat, and red meat that has a lack of preservatives and a lack of uh, materials within the red meat. So basically the grass-fed 
or organic red meats probably have low incidence of cancer. Mm. But smoked, whether it is smoked pork or smoked beef or smoked um, turkey legs, uh, all of those that have been preserved in some manner uh, have are not as safe mm. as the pure varieties. So my recommendations are to eat uh, unprocessed organic meats. And unprocessed organic meats are um, have the safest um, uh, usage. Okay. So uh, stay away from preservatives. Yes. And yes. preserve and nitrates. Meat. Stay away from nitrates. And the nitrates. Yes. Yes. I'm writing this down. I got this on camera now. So, uh, Dr. Mitchell, you are uh, you are a queen at at research. You've been past president of. Uh, the National Medical Association, you've done all these things. How can people get in contact with you? So I can be reached by many different ways. I'm located at Thomas Jefferson University at the Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center. And uh, for appointments, one can call 1-800-JEFF-NOW. So 1-800-JEFF. N O W. One eight hundred Jeff Now. All right. Well, you have heard it here first at the National Medical Association with the incredible Dr. Edith Mitchell. Uh, and I just know. like to add that it's also very important for uh, individuals to participate in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. There are many clinical trials, especially those supported by the National Cancer Institute that offers tremendous benefits for individuals. There is a breast cancer screening trial called T-MIST, that's T-M-I-S-T, mm -hmm. uh, that is ongoing throughout the country. There are prevention trials sponsored by the National Cancer Institute uh, that are ongoing. <coughs> Uh, and other clinical trials for treatment uh, that are not necessarily, some are sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, others are endorsed by or at least on uh, clinicaltrials.gov, okay. which is a National Cancer Institute mm -hmm. site. And with these clinical trials, we can further clinical research give us better technologies, better treatments for cancer. Uh, they are throughout the United States, and many people are concerned about clinical trials, but I can tell you that every treatment that is available in the United States uh, that is approved by the FDA has undergone clinical trials, and therefore it's important that the clinical trials reflect all of us. Mm -hmm. Every racial and ethnic uh, group in the country so that we know that the techniques work in everyone. We know that the metabolic processes in the body, which are a reflection of our inherited uh, genes and other processes, we know that these treatments are effective in all groups. But we also have patients who may have cancer uh, gain exposure to the newer treatments through uh, clinical trials. I was actually at a program once where there was talk about this new agent and clinical trials uh, about it and the new discoveries uh, for cancer. And some of my patients were there and they looked over at me We've been doing that for a long time. Mm -hmm. And that is true because, uh, yes, I do conduct clinical research. I do work with my patients and also the community or the, what is called the catchment area around our cancer center to ensure that individuals in our area have exposure to and access to the best education about cancer 
and its treatment, but also the best technologies uh, such that we're giving patients, for each patient, the right patient, the right treatment at the right time. And therefore, we have precision medicine that can give patients the best treatment. Uh, so very important and very important to uh, receive and for patients to seek that information. So the right patient, the right treatment at the right time. Good. So we can go to clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov mm -hmm. uh, to find that information. And the National Cancer Institute.